recall the hour. Okay. 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 So I look same. Yeah, that works. So I'm record from my side. Okay, I'll send it to you later on. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's it works. That's that's good. All right. Okay. So I get. I can. Uh, can I start now? Yeah. Okay. So before I start my my talk, um, can can you hear me well? Yes. 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 It is perfect. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. that's very good. All right. So before I start my talk, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor uh, Pastor uh, and Professor Weibu for um, their um, um, invitation to, uh, to, 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 to give the keynote lecture, to give lecture in this um, very nice uh, Alice school. I know this school for uh, several years and I, I have been following this um, doctoral school and it has been a pleasure to see many quality lecture uh, in the previous year. So it was my really great pleasure to, uh, to, to, to give uh, one of the, the lecture uh, in this um, in the doctoral school this year. Now, um, the topic I'm going to present today is the, um, on the SPS methods. And uh, before I start my talk, I would like to uh, also take this opportunity uh, to thank my colleagues um, who are not here um, who is currently a um, professor in the University of Dudley, who has been working with me for um, several years and we learned from his order. And I also would like to take the opportunity to thank my former and current PhD student. Um, they are not here, but they are, has been making a significant contribution to my talk. And without their excellent work, um, I would have not um, be able to progress this far in terms of advancing the SPS methods for the application in geomechanics. Now, before going to this, um, um, this application here, um, I would like to show you this, uh, this, this one of the um, very famous um, disaster which occurred last year, and I believe many of us would know what is it. Uh, this has be become one of the very, um, I think I see some, uh, some chat or comment. I need to check what is that. Okay, uh, all right. Um, this has been a very uh, popular um, disaster uh, which occurred in Brazil last year. It's basically the Telling Dam collapse, uh, which killed more than um, 200 people. Um, we have a lot of lessons learned from this, uh, this event here. Uh, in particular, if you're looking at this the report um, which was conducted after the collapse, you would know that the um, this tailing dam here have a very well warning system put in place. Uh, but unfortunately, we was not be able to detect what was happening or, or, or to be, be able to um, predict um, the, uh, the, the, the failure. We also have um, the um, inspection uh, occur one month before the event occurs, but we have was not be able to uh, detect the failure. So uh, the question for us here at a, a geotechnical engineer and as far as the academic who working in this area is, uh, how do we, uh, what can we do to minimize this problem? Um, and obviously, um, the computational methods could play a key role here. Uh, we may not be able to uh, predict the possibility of failure, but we should be able to evaluate the impact of failure if it occurs. And for these reasons, advanced computational methods like um, the S methods would be a powerful tool to uh, not only trying to predict, but also trying to evaluate the consequences of a disaster. And particle may may methods um, is highly suitable for this particular application, and SPS is one of them, uh, but not, the, not only the solution. Now, so what is the SPS methods? Um, to give you an, an idea of what is the SPS methods, uh, I presented here uh, several uh, sort of the, the standard numerical methods in the geomechanic field, which was um, characterized into the continuum and the discontinuum numerical methods. I also uh, classify the methods here based on their feature. 
for example, ranging from mass bay where we have the finite element methods or finite different methods to the high bridge between mass and particle, we belong to the class of particle finite element methods or MPM uh, and the mass free methods, which is the, the only methods uh, that is requiring no background mass. And on the, on the right hand side, you have the discontinuous methods, which is uh, different from the continuous methods and the belong to this class, we have a discrete element method, which is um, not the topic of this <coughs> picture here. And by comparing this um, continuum class of numerical methods that you can see here, and obviously the SPS method is the only numerical methods which require no background mass. And this is completely different compared to the particle finite elements or the MPM methods. And the other uh, feature that you need to keep in mind that many, still, many people are actually asking me, the SPS method um, is called particle methods, but actually some people are actually confusing SPS method and the discontinuous methods. So clearly it should be distinguished here that SPS must be or, or, or actually belong to the group of the continuous methods, where each of the particles here are actually occupies an, a continuum domain and carry out the field information. Now, why SPS method and how does it work? And now, in SPS, the computational domains is basically represented by set of particle, like what you can see from here. And each particle carries or occupy a given continuum domains and carry the few information. The, uh, why this one is not working here? Can I, uh, this one is working. Um, and then um, once we discrete design the computation domains into another particle, uh, we can then using an interpolation procedure to calculate the value at some particular um, location. Here are a couple of key advantages of the methods. Basically, uh, it requires no background mesh and is having the Lagrangian feature and therefore they can simulate extremely large information like what you can see here. The method itself is a non-local approach um, where the information calculated at some particular location are approximated based on information accelerating uh, area. Um, this is the, a couple of limitations. You, if you're looking at a limitation, here are a couple of limitations that you can see from the literature, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, mostly in the literature, they cite these SPS methods at the methods which is suffer from boundary condition or suffer from tensile instability. Uh, to be honest, when I'm looking at this literature, they actually always cite this to the paper which is 30, 40 years ago, and they try to ignore the recent progress of SPS, uh, which I'm going to show you today and see whether we're really having this sort of the serious issue uh, in the recent advance of SPS or not. Um, the question, next question would be, why do we need to use the SPS methods? And I believe that one of the key or the main advantage of SPS methods is to bring or to simulate or to predict the field application. And here is an example where uh, this work was conducted by one of my current uh, postgraduate students, Edward Yang. He have done excellent work in uh, scaling the SPS to the field scale application. And you can see here that we was able to uh, simulate the entire um, the mountain in the um, scale of kilometers, thousand meter uh, scale. And here is an example of the debris flow, uh, which occurred in the um, um, Mount Helens in Washington in 1980, uh, which is uh, quite popular, uh, famous um, sort of the disaster, killed more than 57 people. Um, the method itself uh, can uh, are very well uh, suitable for this application because it requires no background mass or no computation mass for the entire domains. And it can also be used for some other application um, to replay the FEM. For example, with FEM, we know the FEM is very famous for the accuracy of for small deformation. But when it comes to large deformation like what we have here, um, the SPS would be uh, a useful tool to predict the final run out distance. Or the methods can be also quite um, uh, suitable for predicting the um, um, multi-phase problem uh, and this is another excellent work done by one of my current PhD students who are looking at uh, to using the SPS method to simulate the rainfall induced load failure and I'm going to go back to this application in the tomorrow lecture where we discuss about how we attending the SPS methods 
to predict the multi-phase problem. Uh, more challenging uh, is the problem that related to fracture mechanics, and this was the work done by my former PhD student, who has successfully attained this, the SPIT method to um, simulate um, broke fracture, uh, both for the quasi-static and dynamic problem, uh, which I'm going to also um, uh, revisit uh, this application tomorrow uh, at one of the potential application of SPS. So this is a couple of, uh, of um, very quick summary to see what is the potential of SPS method and, 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 and its capability and how we actually, um, why we are using these methods. So with this, I'm going to um, um, start my lecture. Uh, we basically, I'm going to start to giving you some basic idea of what is the SPS method. So I will start with the very fundamental of SPS and how we derive the fundamental equation of SPS. Uh, as well as its alternative uh, formulation. And then I'm going to discuss some of the issue that we have been commonly, commonly uh, that I consider as a misconception about SPS methods. For example, some of the issue related to boundary condition, I'm going to show you that uh, why we actually having our uh, frequently cited that SPS is suffer from the boundary or some other stabilization techniques that, we, that has been established to stabilize uh, the aspect methods and what was the issue that people cited in the literature and what are the confusion come from and we I will end my lecture with some conclusion and um, and, and our look uh, of the methods now uh, to start with the um, you know, with the aspect methods this is the for some of you who are who have uh, uh, new to these methods uh, probably it's a good idea to 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 see actually to know these two uh, paper which is considered at the origin of SPS methods. Uh, it was developed by um, Chingon and Monahan and Luxi for actual physics application, um, basically the formation of star, how to simulate the formation of star. And by the way, Professor Monahan um, is currently a professor at Monash University uh, and he's currently um, uh, uh, retired uh, but still quite active um, uh, at Monash. Um, so what is the SPS methods and why do we need the SPS methods for the computational geomechanics? So to understand that, we probably we need to, what we need to do is we need to see why do we, or what we normally do in the computational geomechanics. So for example, if you want to simulate or, or predict some sort of a slope failure or any problem that I presented before, uh, what we need to do is we need to solve this, what we call governing equation, which basically consists of the mass conservation equation momentum conservation equation and the constant relation. Uh, I assuming the term isothermal system, so I, therefore I will not consider the energy equation. Now, if you're looking at this equation we have here, you can see that in the first equation, you can actually calculate the rate of the chain of density with respect to diversion of velocity. And here you actually involve the spatial derivative of the, of the density. Similarly, in the momentum equation, this equation normally used to describe the motion of particle with nothing but the Newton second law. This equation allows you to describe the motion of particle, okay? And again, this equation involves the spatial derivative of the stress tensor. And finally is the concept relation, which is basically um, the relationship between stress and strain is commonly used and required to complete the governing equation. And this equation also involves the strain rate tensor, which is the spatial derivative of the velocity. Now, when you're solving this system equation in the continuum mechanics, you would need a numerical method to approximate or to discretize this spatial derivative. And these methods have their, their different way to calculate or approximate this term. And the more robust method, the better when it's moving to the field scale application. And the entire idea of the SPS methods was basically built to approximate this term. And I'm going to show you how we approximate this term and what are the alternative form that we can have in the, um, in, in the when, when it comes to the SPS approximation. Now, I will start with the foundation of SPS. So what is the SPS methods? To give you an idea of what is the SPS methods, first, we need to consider what we call a continuum field. This is the continuum field that I'm, I consider. And this continuum field is basically represented by a set of particles or the point mass. Each point mass here is occupying a volume space and having a certain mass and carry out the field information. Now, the common question that I would ask here is, how do I calculate 
the continuous density field at a given location. If I want to con calculate continuously density field at this location, what is that and how I do that? How do I do that? Okay. The simple way to do it obviously is to, for example, if you're looking at the, the particle at this location, the one of the most simple ways to calculate the continuous density field, density field at this location is to take the sum or to define a sampling volume, right? Which is basically V sub SP. And then calculate the total mass of all particle located within, located within this volume and then averaged by the volume. And this is the formulation, the first formulation we can use to calculate uh, the density or the continuous density field. And you can see from the equation is the continuous density is going to the sum of the total mass, which is the mass inside this continuous volume here, and then divide to the volume of the, of the sampling volume. Okay, this is quite straightforward. What is the issue associated with this? If you're looking at the way we estimate the density based on this formulation, you see that this particle here and the particle there is actually close to the boundary of the sampling volume. Meaning that if I extending the control volume or sampling volume, or if I string the sampling volume, I can end up with either exclude this particle or include this particle. This actually results in the fact that this formulation here, basically we produce a very noise density um, uh, estimation, which is not ideal for the continuum um, the mechanics. What else we can do from here? Now, in order to avoid this problem, what you can do is instead of taking the equal contribution of all particle mass, like what we're doing here, what we can do is we can, using a sort of what we call weighting average approach, where we still define a sampling volume like what we have here, but instead of taking the equal contribution to the center particle, what we're doing now is we're taking the contribution but weighted by this kernel function, W here. This W function here, we're basically having a peak value, the peak value at this location, and gradually reduce at a distant uh, increase and vanish at this location. And if we are doing this, then we will end up with a different way to estimate the density. Now, the density at a particular, at a given point here, will be calculated by the sum of the mass inside this area, then weight this with the kernel function W. This kernel function W need to satisfy some certain condition. And in particular, if you want to remove the boundary effect here, this kernel function needs to be vanished at this location. And this kernel function needs to also reach peak value at the center and gradually reduce. And this is the, the key idea. This equation here, we're actually giving us a better approximation compared to the, to the previous one. Now, what we can do next from here is now we're having this equation, right? We're having this equation here, which is nothing but the estimation of the continuous density field. The next step we can do is we can actually replace this mass by the products of density and the volume. This volume here is basically the volume of the particle, okay? And then from this, what we can do next is we're replacing F by V. This is replaced by F and we're replacing by F function. And this giving us the final formulation, which is that formulation. This formulation here telling us what? This formulation here telling us that if or a few variable, a few variable at uh, any location i, for instance, can be always calculated by the sum of the inform information within the domain, the supporting domains, weight is with the, with the kernel function. And this is the foundation of the SPS methods. This equation is the basic equation which can be used to derive any uh, existing or other SPS formulation. Um, now, so what you're looking at here is how about the kernel function? Now, this is the fundamental SPS equation, but it's relied, the accuracy of this equation needs to actually rely on the kernel function. What is the definition of kernel function and what is the requirement of the kernel function in order to ensure that this function can reproduce um, the desirable results. And you can see from here that this kernel function needs to be, first of all, to be symmetric, you know, to make sure that if the particle having a same distance to the center of the uh, sampling volume, 
they should have the equal contribution. It needs to be positive defined to avoid any issue uh, associated with the, uh, with the, with the negative um, field function. Um, it needs to reach the peak value at the center. So basically, this is the peak value at center and then gradually reduce. Basically, to reduce the boundary effect, it needs to reach zero at the boundary. And finally, this equation needs to ensure the total mass conservation, right? Because when we approximate the density to our entire system, you want to ensure the, the mass conservation equation. And these conditions are required to um, ensure the, the mass conservation. And this condition is nothing but can be basically derived from, from this here. So you can see now the basic SPS formulation or the foundation of the SPS methods was actually derived from the density estimation or from the very fundamental question of how do I estimate the density of a field uh, from um, a, a, a representation, uh, a set of particles. Uh, very, very simple. This is the key concept or the core idea of SPS. Um, these two, um, with respect to the uh, kernel function, uh, this is a list of conditions that uh, need to be satisfied that we discussed previously. Uh, and there's already in the literature a number of different kernel functions that satisfy this list of conditions. Gaussian kernel function is one of the very popular and one of the first kernel functions used by Mona Harms. And you can see that the red line here is actually the function of the of the kernel, or the value of the kernel function, with reaching peak at the uh, center and gradually, gradually reduced to zero. It first and the second derivative actually smooth, and this is very important condition. Why they need to be smooth? I'm going to explain this one later on. Uh, on the other hand, the the way the Gaussian kernel function here actually have some limitation because if you're looking at this kernel function, you see that they actually never reach zero they're actually approaching zero, right? But it's never reaching zero. Meaning that when you're using this Gaussian kernel function, you need to take the information of the entire computation domain into consideration, which is quite time consuming. I'm going to, to go back to this uh, uh, topic later on when we discuss about the selection of kernel function in SPS. Now, so we're talking about the uh, SPS approximation of a function, right? So how about a gradient? Right. If you normally you know that in the in the momentum equation we have the gradient of a function, but here we only have the SPS approximation of a function. Now to, to obtain the SPS approximation for the gradient, what we can do is quite simple. From this fundamental equation, what we can do is we can replace, we can replace this term here. Replace this term by the gradient of the function, simply replace by gradient of function. And then it ends up with this equation. The equation telling us what? The equation telling us that the gradients of a function at a given location can be calculated by the sum of gradient of the function at the neighboring particle or neighboring point, multiplied with the volume of its point and the weighting function. Very clear that the equation can be done, but it's not, uh, not good because when you approximate the gradient of a function, you actually require to calculate the gradient of the function at the at other location. And this you have disadvantage when you have a discontinuity function. For example, if f is discontinuity, then this, this approximation is, is no longer suitable. So what can we do to avoid this? We can do next is to basically apply the Gaussian theorem, right? The Gaussian theorem or divergent theorem um, in our term. We can actually helping us to converse this equation here into this equation. Now, how to uh, converse this, uh, how to apply the Gaussian theorem here, please refer to my lecture notes to see the detail of derivation. I'm not going to explore here. But the key feature of this, this derivation is to basically converse this uh, to change this gradient of the function to the gradient of the kernel function. Meaning that now, if I want to estimate the gradient of a function, at a given location, what I can do is I can take the sum of the value of the function, right? Now it's the value, no longer the gradient, but it's actually the value of the function within this supporting domain, but I multiply with the gradient of the kernel function. So instead of the, the calculating the gradient of the function, now I calculating the gradient of the kernel function. And this happening a lot in the sense that when you have 
a function which is not continuous. Okay. On the other hand, because of this feature, the kernel function needs to be smooth. So when you define a kernel function, the kernel function needs to have the smooth first derivative in order to make sure this approximation work. And this is a, a very straightforward approach. And you can see the process that we derive here. This is the foundation of fundamental SPD equation, and this is how we end up with the uh, SPS approximation for the gradient of the function. Very straightforward, and all starting from this foundation uh, SPS formulation. Now, um, the question uh, we would ask here, is it a good estimator? Um, look like uh, the method is quite straightforward. Uh, gradient of a function can be simply calculated by the sum of all other functions multiplied with the value here. Would this be uh, a straightforward approach, okay? Now, what you can comment here is, even though this equation is quite simple, it actually does not ensure the gradient of a constant field variable vanish. What does that mean? Assuming that this function here is constant, right? if it's constant value, if this function is constant value, then the gradient of this function needs to be zero. However, based from the SPS operation here, this approximation will be different from zero. Therefore, this equation does not ensure the gradient of the function is vanished. Furthermore, from this, you can see that when the particle here, this approximation is highly dependent on the, um, the uniform distribution of particle. In particular, if the particle here are highly uh, disordered or randomly distributed, the accuracy of this estimation is very poor. So how can we improve this uh, issue and where the source of error come from? To understand where the source of error come from, what I can do is we can, looking at this equation, what I'm going to do here is I replace this term by fi, and then the gradient now is simply written in this form. To understand where the issue come from, what I can do here is I can apply what I call the Taylor expansions of the function f trace. Now this Taylor expansion of function of trace here actually giving me this term. You can see that. This is the expand Taylor expansion up to the second order accuracy. And you can see very clear now that if you further expanding this equation, you further expanding the equation, you see that now this, the accuracy of this approximation up to the second order accuracy is now depending on <coughs> depending on how would the SPS approximation ensure this term, these two terms. This term is supposed to be zero in order to ensure that this guy is equal to, to, and this guy is in, equal to one, to ensure that the gradient of this one is equal to this one, okay? So very clear, based on the Taylor expansion of the function F trace, now I can see a clear source of error. The first source of error comes from this term and the second source of error come from this term. And if somehow I can warranty or I can uh, make sure that this approximation here equal to zero and this approximation here equal to one, then my gradient, um, SP gradient of suppression is represent or produce exactly uh, value up to the second order accuracy. However, this is not always the case because in SPS, this guy never actually approaching zero, and this guy also never approaching one. He's always having the error, and this is the main error source. The question here would be, how do I remove this error? One of the simple and straightforward approach to remove this error is to deduct the error from this function. So what I can do here is, I can deduct the error, okay? Look at this, this is the way I'm going to do. I can deduct this error from the equation. And you can see from here that basically, I taking this approximation, I deduct this error, which giving me that equation here. And then this actually giving me another form of SP approximation. Now, from here, you can see that instead of having the SPS approximation simply relies on the value of FJ at a neighboring particle, now by deducting the error here, I actually end up with a new formulation where the gradient of the function is actually depending on the difference 
between the neighboring particle and the value of function at the center of particle. And interestingly, if you're looking at the equation, this equation actually makes sure that when f equal to constant, the gradient of f is vanished. Right? It's very interesting. This equation ensure the gradient of a constant field vanish. And this is one of the most popular SPS formulation that has been commonly used in the literature. This, are, however, we still have keep in mind that we still having the error here. This is the error we have not eliminated, okay? So even though they are very popular SPS formulation, but it still suffer from this error. What else we can do from here? To actually remove this error, and to ensure that our SPS gradient approximation up to the second order accuracy. And to do this, what we can do next is we can, again, take away this error, right? Take away this error. So basically, we deduct this error and we divide to that error. Then we obtain another different equation with another quite popular SPS formulation. Um, we can be used to obtain up to the second order accuracy uh, of the gradient approximation of a function. So the gradient of the function now is actually a sum of the different of value between these two normalized to the gradient uh, of the volume uh, of one particle within the supporting domain. Okay. Now let's see the performance of these uh, two equations. If you look at the two, three equations here, this is the original SPS formulation. And if you are using this formulation to approximate the gradient of a linear function like what I but here, basically, I'm using a function, very simple function to test, f equal x plus y. And if you are using this formulation to approximate this function for this particle distribution here, so we're using a quite randomly particle distribution, and this particular distribution here is following the Voronoi distribution, um, random particle. And you can see that the prediction of this function are very nice, right? Very nice and not accurate at all. Now, however, if you actually involves the second equation, the second equation, which we derive by removes the first error source. You can see now that it, this equation produced quite good result for the area that is inside uh, this domain, but they actually suffer from a low accuracy at the boundary. This is obvious because when the SPS approximation come to this place, come to the boundary, you don't have particle um, uh, at the boundary area. And as a result, you actually, um, the value are dropped at the boundary, okay? However, if you actually using the last equation that we discussed here, the last equation that we actually normalize um, with, the, with the sum, which is this equation there, this is the equation we discussed, we normalize with this term. Now with this equation, we can actually produce quite nice uh, prediction of the gradient of the function. Now we can exactly, if you're taking gradient of this function, you actually produce the value of one and this function produce exactly result uh, of one for a very random um, particle distribution right here. And you can see that starting from original SP equation, we can using a couple of different transformation to obtain a good operator, SP, SPS operator. But keep in mind that the tricky thing in SPS is the good operator may not be always a good operator. Right? The good SPS operator here may become the best one later on. Okay, so I'm going to discuss and explore some of this later on. Right, so this is related to the the gradient of the SPS. So so far we have discussed how we obtain the SPS approximation for a function, how we obtain the SPS approximation for the gradient of the function, and how we get rid of the error of the function to obtain the high accuracy up to the second order. Uh, for a gradient of a function, right? Now, let's see how we actually apply this method to the geomechanics. Now, with the aspect within the geomechanics discipline, um, there's a lot of research has been uh, conducted uh, back to 1990, but perhaps two of the very popular paper, a very highly cited paper was the one uh, that I listed here, um, each of which actually using a quite different approach. And for a deep integrated by Professor Ambassador, will be presented in the um, in the uh, tomorrow lecture. Uh, but today I'm going to more or less focus on, on the, the framework that we presented in this, in this um, first paper. Now, when it comes to um, a geomechanic application, um, what you can see here is 
again, in geomechanics, we need to, um, to use the continuity equation, right? We need to use the continuity equation and we have the mass conservation equation. Uh, the mass conservation equation here allow us to calculate density change or the voice data change, right? Or porosity change. We have the momentum equation to describe the motion of the particle, like what we can see here. And we have a constipulation to describe uh, the relationship between strength and strength. Now, what we're doing now is we're going to use the SPS approximation equation that we had up pre, uh, in the previous section to approximate this term, all of this, right? But then we're going to focus more on the, um, the, the capability or the issue associated with the information, okay? Now we start with the uh, mass conservation equation. This is the, one of the traditional way to obtain um, the mass conservation equation. And you can see from here, this is how we, um, we, uh, we establish the density chain, which is basically calculated from, from a diversion of velocity. And this is the term that we need to approximate and we need to discretize out, okay? Now, what we can do here is we can actually, using the, uh, the SP um, uh, approximation. And this is, again, we're using this, we start with this um, SP approximation first, right? Um, what we can do is we obtain this equation, right? We obtain this equation here. Very simple. We basically replacing this F, right? We're replacing this one for that one, right? Or replacing F by V. Then we obtain this equation of the, of the continuity equation. And the continuity equation now can be calculated by the density of the particle itself multiplied with the sum of the, um, the, the dot products between the velocity and the gradient of the, of the, um, the kernel function. This equation is quite straightforward, but it's actually having the similar issue like what we discussed previously. They actually uh, produce non-smooth diversion velocity operator because of the issue when we have a constant velocity field, this approximation does not guarantee that the constant velocity field vanish. And as a result, we are having this sort of problem. And therefore, these equations are not commonly used in the, the literature. And the other option are to address this problem, what we can do next is we're using a better SPID op operator that we discussed previously, where now if we're replacing F by V, we obtain this equation. And again, now the density change, it actually uh, relies or depending on the relative velocity between two particles when you are actually uh, calculating or approximating the value for this particular function. This equation giving you a better um, SPID approximation and it's produced quite smooth diversion of velocity, right? Obviously, if you have a constant velocity field, you can obtain the exact solution like what you have here. And keep in mind that the gradient or function here have to be normalized like what we discussed before to remove both the first and second error source, okay? Now, this equation obviously is the good one, right? But what you can see here is we actually deriving the mass conservation or continuity equation following the traditional way, and this is the strong form of the mass conservation equation. Within the SPS um, context, we actually can arise at a, at a very similar equation without um, using the traditional approach that I'm going to discuss later on. And this is the comparison between uh, two equations. Uh, the first equation which is not very popular and the issue is due to the fact that this density, this SP approximation, the not guarantee the constant field function is vanished and this operator actually have to remove all the first and second uh, source of error in the SPS operator. And as a result, this equation can reproduce exact um, the density um, change uh, that what, what we require for um, the simulation. Now, what we have done um, so far is we following the traditional approach to derive this equation. Apart from this, and perhaps one of the most interesting feature of SPA is I don't need the traditional continuity equation, but I can still find a different way to rewrite the equation. And what I'm going to show now, show you now is quite interesting. So in the early slide, I start with this formulation. Now in the early slide, I actually trying to show you how we establish the SPA equation and how we establish or estimate a density at a given location. 
right? This is the very fundamental SPF equation. So what you, in this equation is, if you want to calculate the density of this equation location, all you need to do is to calculate the sum of the mass within this sampling volume, multiply or weight this with the kernel function, right? This is the, the equation I showed at the beginning. Now, what I can do from here is, I can actually taking the time derivative of this function. If I'm taking the time derivative, right? The time derivative of this function, I can immediately obtain this equation. So you can see that starting from the density estimation, taking the time derivative of this equation, I um, end up with a SPS approximation for a continuity equation. This equation here actually take into account or having an extra terms here, we actually take into account the variation of this smoothing length, right? This smoothing length here. So with meaning that if I have less particle, I need to expanding this supporting domains to accommodate more particle. Or if I have more particle, I need to string this smoothing length to make sure that my calculation is correct. And you can see from here, it's quite interesting feature is this density approximation can be used to derive the continuity equation. We can automatically adjust depending on the, um, the, um, the, 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 the information we are given. Now, if H here, on the other hand, is set to be constant, then this guy equal to one, with meaning that it equation is go back to original equation. So this is another interesting feature of SPS. I can actually ignore all of the continuum mechanics. I can derive, still derive the continuity equation based on this density estimator, right? And then the same concept was also applied to derive the, the, motion, uh, the motion equation, but I'm not going to explore in, in this lecture. Now this is now the quite interesting uh, concept of SPS. So you can see the conclusion here is the time derivative of the density estimation actually giving us a smooth diversion of velocity operator or can giving us the continuity equation, which is quite a nice feature of the, of the SPS. Now, so how about the momentum equation? Uh, similar to the, um, similar to the uh, mass conservation equation, in the momentum conservation equation, which is basically the Newton's second law, here you have the uh, mass uh, uh, per volume, unit volume multiplied with acceleration, and here you have internal force, and this is the external force. So what you need to do now is you need to uh, approximate this term, uh, because it's actually the spatial derivative of the, of the stress profile. What we can do is we can, again, using a very good SPS operator. This is the, so far we have established that this formulation is a good formulation because they actually produce the correct SPS approximation for the gradient approximation. And therefore I named this one as a good SPS operator. And if we are using this good SPS operator to approximate the momentum equation, we end up with this equation. What does it mean by this equation? The equation telling you that now you can actually calculate the acceleration and this is the mass per unit volume based on step different. Right? This is the, the momentum equation that we expect this after employing a good SPS operator here. What happening is if you're looking at the equation itself, you can see that this is the force. This is the force acting on particle I or this is the force acting on particle I. And very clear from the equation is, the force acting on the particle I is different from the force acting on particle J. Or in other words, when you have the particle I approaching the particle J, right? Particle J. The force produced by particle J to particle I is actually different from the force produced by the particle J acting on the particle I. Meaning that this equation are actually this not conserve the linear and angular momentum, right? Very clear, this operator telling you that the force fueled by particle I are different from the force fueled by particle J when they're approaching each other. Or very simple term, they do not conserve the linear and angular momentum. What is the problem of this? If you want to see the problem, here's a problem. And what we're doing here is, we're actually setting up a, a, a I think I hear some background noise uh, from, okay. Right, sorry. 
Okay. So what we're doing here is we um, we setting up um, we setting up a simulation for this particular program where we have um, a uni initially uniformly distributed particle, um, and each a particle here uh, um, uh, actually uh, tries to a random um, uh, stress profile. Right? We we giving this random stress profile to each particle, and you can see that. I, if we are using this formulation to approximate um, or to calculate, if we're using this equation to calculate the motion of this particle um, here, and keep in mind that the particle in the boundary here outside uh, remain fixed, and the particle inside this area, uh, we allow to have the free motion following this momentum equation. Now, if we're using this equation, we see very clear that this equation will end up with this highly uh, unstable solution and you can see that um, finally the particles are getting clumping to each other and they even blow up uh, at the end uh, because of the um, the issue related to a linear and angular momentum conservation equation and very clear now that you can see we actually using a good SPS operator to approximate the governing equation but then we end up with these results Meaning that the good SPS operator now become a vast choice for the momentum equation, right? So, what we can do, or what can we do to fix this problem? Now, to fix this problem, what they can do is we can start like this. So we have the this is the this is the original momentum equation. Now, what they can do is we add this term to the momentum equation. Now you can see that when we add this term to the momentum equation, this guy actually equal to zero because gradient of one is equal to zero. So we're actually adding zero to the momentum equation. And as a result, next, what we're going to do is we're going to using a bad SP operator. This is the best one compared to this one. This is the good one, right? But this is the best one. We're going to use the best one, right? And then we, by using this, we end up with this equation. Quite interesting, even though we are using the bad SPS operator, but we end up with quite nice governing equation or, mo or momentum equation. We conserve both linear and angular momentums. It's quite interesting. The reason is if you have two particles now approaching its order, they both actually feeling the same amount of force acting um, on each particle um, in the pairs Y minor. And that's why they actually conserve both linear and angular momentum. And you can refer to my lecture notes to see how we actually prove that this equation conserves both linear and angular momentum. And how about its performance? This is the, uh, the demonstration of its performance, right? What we're doing here is very similar to previous. What we're doing here is we again create um, a continuum domain with a uniform initial particle distribution. And we fix the particle at the boundary or outer domain here. And we allow the particle inside domain here. Uh, to move freely. And to activate the motion, what we're doing here is we assign an initial random stress distribution to this domain. And you can see that by using this form of equation, can somebody, can somebody, uh, I think there's somebody, and uh, there's some background noise. Uh, maybe you can, you can, you can, you can mute that, um, that applicant. Okay, I think I can use them. All right. Now, um, what we're doing here is with, uh, you can see here with this bus SPS operator, it's actually become a very good choice for a momentum equation because they actually producing a quite nice uh, momentum equation uh, that conserves both linear and angular momentum, which is quite interesting feature. And you, now you see that with various options that I have showed you previously, um, the SPS have quite flexible choice, and sometimes the good operator may become the best one, and sometimes the best one may be become very useful. So what I mean here is in SPS, we need to understand very clearly the key feature of its approximation and make sure we are using this oper operator correctly in order to obtain uh, a correct solution. Now, uh, in summary, this is a, a couple of uh, um, the um, 
uh, SPS formulation that we can obtain based on the derivation we have previously. Now you can see here, with the regard to the mass conservation equation, uh, this is the original form of SPS approximation that we can uh, obtain. This equation has been most commonly used in actual physics and is suitable for actual physics. But unfortunately for our application, they are not suitable because if you are using this equation here to approximate the density at this particular location, the density would be significantly dropped. Uh, we will not result in the correct uh, result. On the other hand, if you're using this equation, the density change is actually uh, more or less depending on the velocity difference at this particular location, and therefore they can produce a better result. Um, however, this formulation here is only suitable for a homogeneous slope, a homogeneous material, because the density or the summation, uh, the density change now, it actually calculate this based on the mass. So if you're looking at the, uh, the approximation, this density at I is actually depending on the mass of, of change here, right? So if you're having a non-homogeneous soy profile, like what you have here, soy one and soy two, with significant different density, meaning that when you calculate the density at this location, you would need to take the mass of soy one to calculate the mass of soy two. Therefore, this equation is not good for, for non-homogeneous slope. Alternatively, you can have a different equation here, which actually only relies on the volume. So you have here density change equal to the density of particle itself multiplied with the volume, right? The volume, not the mass. This one you multiply with the mass, but this one you multiply with the volume. So this is the key difference. This equation is suitable for the multi-layer problem where you have the non-homogeneous slope with highly uh, different density profile. If, if that is the case, this equation needs to be used. On the other hand, when you are using um, a homogeneous slope like what you have here, you should use, you can use this equation, okay? This is a, a couple of uh, conclusion. And in terms of the um, Momentum, um, this is the only equation that we should not use because this equation does not conserve the momentum. On the other hand, we can have an alternative form of the momentum equation, which actually conserves exactly the linear and angular momentum. Um, okay, now, so that is the, um, the, the starting point of SPS and how we're actually using the SPS to approximate the mass and then and, 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 and the momentum conservation equation. Next is coming to the, um, the selection of the kernel function because you can see what we done previously, all we actually require a uh, selection of the, the kernel function, right? This we have not actually discussed in this. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to discuss how do we actually select a suitable kernel function. Then there's a lot of issue actually associated with the selection of kernel function when it's coming to the SPS application to uh, the engineering of uh, engineering and this actually uh, the source of the confusion that we may have so this is the uh, the condition of the kernel function that you might um, remember i presented in the uh, first couple of slides when we're talking about the sps approximation for density field and very clear that when you're using the sps the kernel function need to be symmetric and positive like we discussed previously to make sure that the particle with the same distance have the equal contribution. And then we also need to make sure that they have the smooth derivative and having compact support domain to make sure that they are not just taking all or entire domain into consideration. And it needs to be um, ensure the mass are conserved. This is the key idea. And in the literature, there is already a number of kernel function, a kernel function that actually satisfy this condition. For example, you can use either Gaussian kernel function, cubic S supply, and Wenland C2 kernel function. This is the three most popular kernel function that is commonly used in the literature. And they are very similar, uh, except the Gaussian kernel function, the cubic S supply, and the, uh, the Wenland kernel function having a very uh, compacted support domain. So basically, the kernel cut off at this location. Uh, the Gaussian is the only one that extends infinite to the entire computational domains. And the other good thing of these three kernel functions that they all having a 
a smooth first derivative, right? This is very important because when you actually approximate a gradient of a function, you actually require uh, the gradient of the of a w function. Then uh, that's why you need a, a smooth um, first derivative of the of the kernel of, uh, kernel function. However, this is selection of the kernel function is also uh, causing a lot of issue, and this is the source of the common misconception of S field in the literature. Now, if you're reading a lot of paper in the literature, you may always read, uh, or you may find that most of paper actually cited to SPS at the method suffer from um, tensile instability or from tensile instability. But what happening here is most of those actually cited to very old paper or cited to the paper who actually misuse of the kernel function. I'm going to show you what is the problem there. What I want to say here is, even though we having uh, a very or uh, a number of choice of the kernel function available in the literature, but the wrong choice of the kernel function will lead to the issue that I call pairing instability. And this pairing instability is very similar to the zero energy modes in the final element or some um, uh, some other numerical methods. And this is often cited at the SPS instability issue, which is quite a mis misunderstanding, all right? misconcept, uh, conceptual. What happened is okay. Now looking at this one. This is an example of using um, a cubic SPLI function. This is the, again, this is the cubic SPLI function, right? The pro um, one here. And this is the results of the SPS simulation for, again, a uni initially uniform distribution of particle with a uniform uh, pressure distribution. And for each of the simulation here, we are all using a cubic SPLI function but the supporting domain or the kernel size are different. For the first one, the size of the kernel is, is following this, um, this, this um, uh, condition, which basically is quite small. When you actually, the middle one are relatively large, right? Which is we're attending this um, supporting domain. And the last one here is extremely large, right? We attend further the supporting domain. What does it mean here is when we're extending this domain, we're actually forcing the kernel to take the kernel to take more particle. So if you're looking at the first one here, you may have around um, 10 or um, 15 particle uh, to contribute to the, to the center particle. This one you may have a double, and this one you may have a triple, right? So this, is, this means that you increase or you force the kernel function to take more particle. And as a result, you actually end up with the issue here. If you don't actually, if you're having the a suitable number of particle, the particle, the simulation remains stable. If you force the kernel function to take more particle, you actually causing what you call instability or what you call pairing instability, where the particle are seem to actually forming a clump like this. This is the worst scenario where you're actually having a very large supporting domain and it's actually causing this problem. Unfortunately, this problem here is actually often cited at instability and they're actually using this condition to cite it that SPS is having the problem, but they don't using this condition. Meaning that if you're actually using a suitable kernel function, then you don't have that sort of instability problem, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you this sort of uh, application later on. Now, the conclusion from this test is the SPS particle formed the clump here due to the wrong use of the kernel function. Keep this in mind. What you can do is where is the source of it come from? Right? What is the source of instability? Where does it come from? Right? Now, what you can do now is we're looking at first, we need to keep in mind that each kernel function who's only accommodate a certain number of particles. So basically you should not try to force the kernel function to take more particles. Because if you force the kernel function to take more particles, it ends up to the situation that we, I showed you in the previous slide, where the particle actually forming the clump. This is the first case. Second, if you're looking at the, the kernel function, you see that this is the motion equation, right? This is the, basically this equation show you how uh, the motion of particle um, basically calculated by the product of the stress 
multiply with the gradient of the kernel function. Now, what happening here is, if you're looking at the gradient of the kernel function here, you see this is the Gaussian kernel function, and this is the gradient of the, of the kernel function. And you can see that the gradient of kernel function actually approaching zero, right? When the distance reduces, they're approaching zero at this location. Meaning that each kernel function have what we call inflection point corresponding to the zero kernel gradient, this location here, right? So each kernel function have zero gradient. So when you having two particles actually getting very close to each other, this W, gradient of W is zero, meaning that the entire term here is also zero. And as a result, the particle, the two particles would not gain enough repulsive force causing the clumping issue that you see in the previous slide. This is the second issue. And however, if we actually have the appropriate choice of the kernel function, we can completely remove this, right? I'm going to show you the example. This is an example of what we can do to remove this error. Now, in this particular case here, I show you a three example with the same simulation setup that we did previously. Initially, we have a uniform particle distribution and we're using three different Gaussian kernel function, which is the popular kernel function that you can see here. Gaussian, cubics, and Wellen kernel, each of which we using a different number of particles, um, um, or we forcing the, the kernel to taking a different level of the particle, right? This one, the last column here showing that all the kernel need to take a large number of particles in the calculation. And you can see from here, you can see from here that now with the Gaussian kernel, when the number of particles are enough, Right? When a lambda particle are within this range, or even with the cubic SPI function, you don't have any problem. But when you're actually taking the number of particles to be large enough, or you force the kernel function to take more particles, you start creating the issue related to pairing instability, like what you can see from here. Right? Gaussians start to producing the issue when they actually forcing taking this mass. Cubic SPI function, immediately start to producing the pairing is pretty when these two are actually equal to three. On the other hand, if you're looking at the wellland kernel, you don't have this problem more or less, regardless of how many particles you actually forcing the wellland kernel, kernel to test. They are always stay stable and you don't have the problem of pairing instability. This actually totally not occur in the wellland kernel function. Now, why is that? Um, this is actually can be explained further by um, a research conducted by Daniel and Ally in 2012, which show that of the three kernel function, the only wellland kernel function is the one that produced the transformation, the Fourier transformation um, are actually positive. Or in other words, what he's saying here is that any kernel function hosts Fourier transformation is negative for some wave vector, will trigger the pairing instability. In these three kernel, kernel functions, Wellen kernel function is the only one that are not suffer from this uh, negative Fourier transformation, and therefore is capable of, um, of, of removing the pairing instability issue. Now, the key message I want to um, deliver from this slide or this uh, information is if we actually using a suitable kernel function with a suitable supporting size, we don't have a problem with a pairing instability. This is the and that result in SPS is not because of SP instability, but it's because of the wrong choice of kernel function causing instability. And this has been a common misconception in the literature, which telling the SPS having instability problem. Now, the issue that they might actually mention in the literature, I believe, is actually related to what we call tensile instability. This is a different issue compared to the, the pairing instability. Tensile instability is, in HPS is the issue that basically occurs due to the positive stress. Now, positive causing attraction force. That means when you have two particles with positive stress, you're actually causing 
the adjusting fork like that, we're causing two particles moving close to each other. It's very similar to the pairing in flexibility, but it's not pairing in stability. It needs to be distinguished from the pairing instability issue because the pairing instability issue was caused by the wrong use of kernel function, while the tensile instability issue is actually caused by the positive stress with causing a trusting fault. These two issues are totally different, right? But what people are referring in the literature are the tensile instability. And unfortunately, the tensile instability are very common in any particle emitters, not just SPS. I'm going to show you an example later on. It actually occurred in all other methods, but the question is whether we're taking it serious or not. And the other source of this, I believe, the misconception is come from this very highly cited paper. Now, this very highly cited paper was conducted in 1995 by uh, Sweco. He basically using the cubic SP light function, which is quite um, and with uh, uh, and analyze the um, the tensile instability problem, tensile instability, not pairing instability, keep that in mind. He analyzed the tensile instability problem and he established the condition. This is the condition. The condition saying that if the product of the strap tensor multiply with the second order derivative of the kernel, kernel function less than zero, then um, the SPS simulation would have, uh, would become or uh, suffer from uh, instability issue. Now, what happened to this? If you're looking at this one, this is the second order gradient. Now, this is the first gradient of the function, and this is a distance, right? It's a distance, this is the first gradient. And you can see this is a, for any kernel function, you should have in this sort of first gradient, right? Distribution. And this second gradient, second order gradient here is nothing but the slope of this guy, right? The slope of the first derivative. Right, the second gradient here. And this condition telling you that the SPS methods are actually unconditionally unstable. That means it's always unstable, right? Regardless of whether you have positive or negative stress, this condition is always satisfied in this in these two domain, meaning that they're unconditionally unstable, right? But this condition is totally wrong because what we analyzed previously, that if we're having a suitable kernel function, we can completely avoid the tensile instability problem. So what happened is when Swago analyzed this problem here, he did not recognize the issue of pairing instability, or he actually combined these two together to establish this condition, right? So when you cite it to this paper, you need to make sure you understand that what you are saying. There you are actually citing to the tensile instability problem, or you actually sign to the, the pairing instability problem. Or keep that in mind. Okay. If you're sharing to the pairing instability problem, then it's, it's wrong. Okay. Now, so what is actually the tensile instability and how does that actually manifest uh, manifest in, 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 in the in the geomechanics? This is the issue that I has um, showed in the early SPS application. Now, this is the issue of what we call tensile instability in SPS, right? Or in SPS application to geomechanics. What happened is when you have the tensile instability problem, you're seeing this sort of behavior. The particles are actually uh, separate or become fragment, uh, fra um, a fracture or fragmentation, that's what you can see from here. And this issue, because it's only happen or occur um, when you have the stress last than zero, and therefore, this case, this tensile instability should only occur in the cohesive soil. This should not occur in the non-cohesive soil, right? This is a very, very important sort of conclusion we need to, uh, to remember. For example, if you're looking at a soil like drucker prager uh, currency model, and this is the uh, mean stress of hydro, the, the I1, a uh, foot invariant stress tensor, and this is the derivative stress, and this is the U condition, right? You're looking at the U function, you can see that for cohesive soil, you actually have the tensile zone. This is the area that causing this instability. On the other hand, if you have a non-cohesive soil, you don't have this tensile area. You don't have this area. And that result, for non-cohesive soil, you should not have any tensile instability problem. So with respect to the tensile instability issue that has been commonly reported in literature, 
they should not occur in the granular soil. They should only occur in the cohesive soil. And we can remove it, okay? We can remove it totally. I'm going to show you how we want to remove it later on. Now, so how are we going to um, remove it? Now, uh, the next question here, uh, quite interesting question, which is, do these issues only occur in SPS, right? So you're looking at the pro problem that we, we, we showed previously, this is the instability issue, right? How about other methods that I'm going to show you? This is the question, and the answer is no, because the same problem occur in different particle methods. For example, here's an example of MPM simulation of the granular material, and you see that there is an issue of particle fragmentation, there's issue of particle clumping, and also issue of particle clumping, clumping here. And this is actually a very common issue in particle methods, not just in SPS. But the problem is, in other methods, uh, they actually did not consider this at the tensile instability, all right? But in SPS, we do consider this at the issue, and as a result, we would need some specific treatment uh, to avoid this sort of problem here. So what can we do to avoid this sort of problem? So first, we need to, to avoid this sort of problem, we need to make sure that we implement uh, a constant model correctly. Because this, without implement constant model correctly, we always create the issue. For example, you create a positive stress in the granular soil, uh, this, this is the issue causing uh, the instability problem, right? And secondly, if you're having the concept model that have the tensile reason, uh, and there's no way you can avoid the tensile reason, then we can, what you can do, or the simplest way to do is to using what we call the artificial stress. And the artificial stress is working in a very simple way. What we do is actually we adding an additional term to the momentum equation. This is the momentum equation. Mm -hmm. This is the additional term adding to the momentum equation. And one of the most commonly used um, artificial stress term was proposed by, by Monahan in 2005. I'm not providing the detail from written here. You can refer to my lecture note to see the detailed equation. But the key idea of this term is actually produce the repulsive force between two particles when they are approaching each other, right? When they are approaching each other. And this force here is only activated in this zone. They should not be activated in this zone, right? In this zone where you have, uh, you have no tensile instability, then this force should not be activated. But when you actually encounter the area with the tensile instability uh, or tensile stress, then you should actually include this term. Alternative to this, right? Alternative to this, you can also, using what they call the tensile cutoff, which is also commonly used in the, in the concept modeling, but that's another issue I'm not going to discuss here. But assuming that I'm not going to do any tensile cutoff, and assuming that I need to uh, avoid the issue associated with the, with the tensile instability, I can simply adding this term into, uh, into the governing equation. We're here actually showing you, it's quite straightforward to, to handle this sort of problem. This is an example of how the artificial stress work. And this is the case where we're modeling the elastic material. And you can see that even with the negative stress that we have on, the, on, the, on, on, on this reason here, even with the negative stress, we can still actually be able to simulate um, the behavior of the solid beam undergo significant uh, bending deformation. Or on the right hand side here, you see um, the simulation of two electric, electric bone collide in order, uh, and the simulation are still remain very stable with this artificial frequency term. When it comes to the soil, now we can actually totally remove the fragmentation that I discussed previously, and you can see this our problem here now can be totally removed from here by adding this artificial stress. On the other hand, for the non cohesive soil, we don't need to do anything, right? The cohesive model, with the correctly implement our cohesive model in SPS, we should be able to obtain a correct result. And this is the, the issue related to instability problem. All right, now, the next issue that I want to discuss here is related to the boundary condition. Now, this is another interesting, um, what I call as a misconception um, in the literature. We're always telling that the SPS methods have the issue with the boundary condition. And to be honest, uh, again, most of these um, uh, paper are scientists are quoted to, uh, to a wrong source. 
the question here is do we really have the issue uh, with the issue uh, with a, do we really have the the boundary issue with the SPF methods and where is this misconception come from this is the, the interesting issue I I actually uh, figure out um, since I doing the SPF methods now what you are seeing here is on this video here showing that the S the original of SPS the SPF method was originally um, invented for astrophysics application, with basically simulating the collision of, of two stars, like what you can see from here. And in this particular application in astrophysics, you don't need the boundary condition because the particle truncation actually is a good feature of SPS. And therefore, here within the astrophysics application, no boundary condition is required, right? However, when you actually bring the SPS methods to engineering application, we need a boundary condition, just like any other methods, finite elements, particle finite elements, and, and any other methods, uh, MPM and so on, are all required boundary condition. For example, like what you have here with the finite element method, we need a special condition to impose the fixed boundary condition. We need also the boundary condition to impose the free loader or the free surface boundary condition, or even some sort of the the loading condition that we are imposed on on the finite element mass we still need the boundary condition so what i'm saying here is any other numerical methods would require the boundary condition and sps when it comes into engineering application we also need a boundary condition so how do we actually handle boundary condition and what type of boundary condition are required now within the geomechanic context what we would need is we would need the Roller boundary condition. This is a roller boundary condition, right? With basically the free slip boundary condition. We also need the fully fixed boundary condition, and this is the fully fixed boundary condition, basically to make sure that the particle or the node at this location are not um, um, undergo any deformation uh, with our zero velocity. Or we need the symmetric boundary condition. Perhaps one of the most difficult boundary condition is the, the confining strap boundary condition, which is um, particular this application here where in the finite element methods you would need to apply a constant uh, confining stress at the outer particle here outer node in, in the finite elements or one of this location here and you also need to ensure that this confining stress actually perpendicular to the to the boundary when the boundary gets in the form and this perhaps one of the most difficult uh, boundary conditions that we're talking about for the other boundary condition here um, it's quite straightforward so in SPS, to model this boundary condition, what we can do is we can using uh, a very quite straightforward approach as well. For example, this is an application when we apply the SPS to model slope failure. And you can see from here that when the SPS approximation or when the particle come close to the boundary, the kernel actually was truncated because you have no particle outside the boundary. And this actually affecting the SPS approximation at the at solid boundary. So what you can do here um, is we can actually using what we call virtual particle or fixed boundary particle. What I, the idea is to place a number of layer particle outside the boundary domains to compensate this truncation error. And then this particle need to having some certain property or condition to impose the required boundary condition. For example, this particle here, fixed particle, need to have to carry a similar property to the adjacent particle here to ensure a smooth um, um, uh, SPS summation. This particle is also uh, motionless, I should not, uh, and carry a virtual velocity to impose a required boundary condition. For example, if you want to impose the zero velocity here, then this particle should carry negative value or opposite velocity uh, to this particle. Uh, and so on. Uh, we also need the, the stress. Um, this particle here also need to carry stress and this is a special condition that we need to, uh, to take into consideration. So what I want to say is, it's quite straightforward. If you want to model a slip solid boundary, you, what you can do is you can, using a boundary particle to represent the boundary and impose a required boundary condition on this boundary particle. Now here is an example of how we actually impose the required boundary condition. For example, if you want to model the fully fixed boundary condition, 
you can calculate, you can extrapolate, right? You can calculate the velocity at this location here by extrapolating the velocity of inside particle and uh, assign uh, the negative value to that velocity, right? Or the stress tensor can be simply calculated by extrapolating the information from the interior particle. This formulation here telling you that the stress at this particle here, at the boundary particle, can be only calculated from the stress of the real particle inside the domain. This is the whole idea, okay? So this is the, how we apply the fully fixed boundary condition. We can also impose the free donor boundary condition. This is the free donor boundary condition, where instead of having a, a, a reverse sign of velocity, now we need to distinguish between the normal velocity and the tangent velocity. So for example, if you have the boundary condition here, you need to have a normal vector and the tangent vector. This is probably the issue that you might think is difficult, but in SPS it's not because this normal vector here can be directly, directly calculated from the SPS approximation of the gradient of the kernel function. For every particle on the boundary, like what we can see here in this location, if you calculate the SPS summation of the gradient of the particle with respect to the boundary particle, you would get the normal and tangent vector of this particular location. So this, again, the boundary condition, the velocity condition are quite straightforwardly applied. The difficult thing, uh, and here is, in, is an example of what you can do with all of these, these things related to boundary condition. For example, we have been showing that we can simulate the bearing capacity problem by using the virtual boundary particle here without any problem. We can actually model soil structure interaction like what you can see from here, uh, where you can um, just um, using the boundary particle to model interaction between soil and solid. Or here is the, the direct sailboat test where we're actually using the boundary particle to model the solid boundary. Or even in this example here, we actually using, a, uh, we impose, we impose or prescribe the stress on the particle that is located right on the, on the surface, which is very similar to FEM, and we can still exactly obtain what we, what we want to, 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 to simulate. So in other words, we don't have any issue with the boundary condition uh, similar to other methods. We, we, can, we can use or we can develop any some sort of the, uh, the required boundary condition for SPS. One of perhaps the most difficult boundary condition that we may need to uh, to keep an eye is the stress boundary condition. And this is the, the case where you need to look at how this sort of boundary condition uh, uh, are imposed. Now, this is an example of the finite element simulation and these experimental results. Uh, obviously in FEM, you can simply select the point at this particle location, impose a confining stress and ask the software to do whatever they do to impose the confining stress. But when it comes to extremely large deformation, FEM will not capable of simulating this problem, right? So we, when we, we're talking about the boundary condition, we need to also put it in, in the right context. FEM is good for small deformation. SPS, we can using exactly the same boundary condition for small deformation. But if you want to simulate this problem, uh, we need to use a special way and how we actually doing this. So what we can do now is, in SPS, there's a couple of options available. We can actually you create the third option is to create a boundary particle to impose the confining stress. But this is obviously not a good condition, not good ways, because it would be very complex to create a boundary particle right here. The other way to do is to follow the finite element methods to impose, to select a particle on the boundary and impose the required stress. And we can, it's totally fine to do this and it's, it's work very well, but it's only suitable for small deformation. Right, similar to FEM. You can use exactly the same approach like FEM to impose the stress on the boundary, but it only works for small deformation. What we want to do is we want to aim for something that's more advanced, something like the experiments, something like what we show in this video here, where extremely large deformation uh, can be carried out by SPS, and this is why we need to require the SPS method. So how do we do? This is the approach we have been uh, uh, achieved very recently. Uh, and published last year. What we're doing here is, if you're assuming you are consider um, the uh, continuum volume here. By the way, I do we need a break? 
Uh, Manolo, uh, we continue or we need a break? Uh, as, as you wish, I mean, the, you, we still have until, I think it was, let me check, 11, 11, 20, 11, 20 more or less. So if you wish to make a break, that would be okay. If not, we can continue because it is more or less 35 minutes left. But anyway, we are going to have a, also a break at, uh, at 11, 11, 12 or something like 10 minutes. I can, I can continue with uh, it, it up to you. You choose, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just like Manolo just said, maybe only 35 minutes left. So you yeah. just, maybe just pull it through. Right? Okay. Okay, then I will go ahead, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, uh, I'm going to show you how we, how we, um, uh, we develop the required um, confining stress bar recognition for SPS. So what we're doing here is we consider uh, uh, a continuum body basically subtracted to uh, a confining stress, uh, which is a, a constant confining stress, sigma sub c uh, on the on the surface, right? And all we do in this uh, in this approach is to add an additional term into the momentum equation of SPS particle. And we need to design this term in such a way that it only produces a constant confining stress to the outer particle or to a particle that is located on the, on the boundary. And this is the key idea. Now, the idea, the approach we are doing here is we, what we do is we assign, we, we represent this continuum body by a set of particles like what we have in SPS. And then we assign initially, assign initial constant stress, sub mass six sub C, to all particle. And then for every particle, we're using this equation. Meaning that this equation actually in SPS would produce this term, right? This is the, this, if you're having additional sigma C to every particle, they actually add up some component to this, this equation. Now this having a different form, but this is the, the term we're adding into the, into the momentum equation. What we want to prove now is this equation or this term here, this term here will produce a constant confining stress on the boundary regardless of how the particle deform. Okay, so how does it work? Now we're starting from this term, we're looking at this is the term we added into the, into the uh, momentum equation. And what you can see that this term can be actually rewrite in the integral form. It's very clear here. This summation can be replaced by the integral, like what we have here. Okay. Now, what happened to this term is what we can do is now we can further expanding this term by adding this component and take away that component. It's very simple, right? So basically, we're adding nothing to the equation. And then we end up with this equation. This equation, we just rearrange the equation here. Adding this term, this becomes two sigma ci. Take away this term, now it becomes sigma j minus sigma ci. Now these equations are exactly the same. If you're looking at this equation, you would see that, you would see what? You would see that this term here, because we actually, every particle have a constant confining stress. And as a result, this term are vanish across the computational domains. Right? And as a result, when you're having this term, you actually get into this. This is the only term we have in that, in that equation. Further from this, what you can do is you're looking at this. This is the volume integral, right? This is a volume integral, it's a volume. We can using the diversion theorem to basically convert the volume integral into the surface integral, right? So this is the, the term we basically obtain by the Gaussian theorem or the diversion theorem. Now, now we apply this term into this, 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 this domain. What you can see is this term here, W function, this W function are symmetric, right? We have symmetric W function. And as a result, for any integral of a closed surface, this term is vanished for a closed surface, right? Meaning that these terms vanish for any integral inside the domain, but not at this location. This location, they are not vanished because this integral are not a closed surface, right? 
So what you can do next, next is for this, for a surface integral here, when it comes to, when it comes to the dislocation, right? It comes to the location, this surface integral can be replaced by the sum of this integral inside domain here plus with the outside integral, which is this term and that term. Okay. Now you see that again for this term here, they actually forming a closed surface. And as a result, the term vanish. But this term is not because they are open surface. The outer one is open surface, which is basically that surface here. And as a result, you see that this one vanishes, but this one is not, right? If you're looking at this one here, they actually equal to the minus of stress, right? Stress here, multiply with the integral of, the, of this one here, right? Of this area, meaning that this one acting at a confining stress. So you can see this term that we added into the Lobin equation, eventually producing the confining stress, regardless of how the particle deform. And this is quite interesting. So we don't actually doing uh, most complicated things. What we all we do is we assign an initial constant stress to own particle, own particle inside and also on the boundary. And then we're using this equation to calculate the particle motion. And if this is the case, we're going to automatically produce a constant confining stress acting on the boundary of particle. And this all we do here is we actually making use of the kernel kernel truncation property of SPS to impose a confining stress uh, condition. So how does it work? Uh, this is uh, an example of what we're doing here is to prove that how do, uh, it work here. What we do is we um, consider a continuum domains like what we see here. We can represent it by again S bit particle, and we want to assign. Uh, we want to simulate this problem under a confined stress of 10 kPa. So what we did is we impose uh, initially we giving all the particle here with a constant stress sigma c at 10 kPa on top of the stress that a particle would have. Right? This is the on top of stress a particle would have, and then we are using this formulation, and here is the result that you can. You can see, you can see that now after conducting the simulation using this equation, we can actually obtain a quite good, right? This is the, uh, the expected confining stress that we, we obtain. For this case, um, we, did, we did not actually giving the initial uh, 10 kPa to, the, to every particle, but we only giving to the outer, um, uh, for, sorry, for this case, we did not actually assign the initial stress condition, but for this case, we assign the initial stress condition. And you can see that for all cases, we actually obtain exactly um, the required confining um, uh, stress condition. And also this figure here showing you how actually the um, confining vector apply on the boundary of particle. So it's actually um, normal to the, to the surface boundary. So this is a, a very simple test. And then we bring this one to a very complicated step where we're looking at a triaxial problem. So we try to simulate this problem. Uh, is this again uh, a, a triaxial test where we impose a, a given concerning stress of 150 kPa to own whole particle. And then we're sharing the soil under uh, the triaxial loading path. Right? We're sharing the soil under the triaxial loading path that we have here. And then what we're doing here is we measure the stress loading pass. And you can see that um, this is the, the global trash loading pass, which is basically um, um, following the trash loading that condition. And you can see that when the sample undergoes small deformation, we actually obtain quite a good stress loading pass. But as soon as we see some particle inside the soil domain undergo plastic deformation, our loading path are uh, slightly deviated from the um, the expected loading part, but this is very common and is attributed to the structural failure. On the other hand, if you're looking at the, on the pipeline, as you can see here, with the new boundary condition, we actually impose exactly the triaxial loading condition, right? So this is the, the expected outcome. And you can see how we actually um, using a very simple approach to in SPS to impose a confining boundary stress condition in SPS, okay? Uh, for detail of this work, you can refer to, to our work published in, in NAC um, last year. 
Now, um, the other issue I also want to discuss with related to SPS is uh, it's a dissipative term. Uh, obviously, if you're looking at this SPS motion equation here, you see that this equation are actually uh, a fully dynamic equation, a right? fully dynamic equation, uh, especially when you're looking at the um, when simulating the elastic material where you don't have any dissipative term in the uh, displacement mechanism in the concept model, then uh, this equation uh, are subjected to full vibration. And in the absence of any dissipative term here, the particle in the simulation will be subject to free oscillation uh, due to the unbalanced forces. And as a result, um, some sort of the, um, the, 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 the dissipative term are required. And the most commonly used dissipative term are actually proposed by Mona Hans, which basically added into the motion equation. And this is the, uh, the dissipative term actually uh, formulated by Mona Hahn. And if you're looking at this dissipative term here, they actually simulate what? They actually approximate the fluid viscosity. Keep in mind that Mona Hahn actually proposed this term for fluid mechanic application um, and also astrophysics application and therefore they approximate the fluid viscosity, which is correct because this term here, divergence of velocity is corresponding to this term in, in the SPS, right? So as a result, when you're actually using this Monohan equation uh, of the dissipative term, you actually introduce the shear stress into the soil or shear viscosity into the soil. And therefore, um, the larger amount of the viscosity introduced into the, uh, into the momentum equation, the more displacement energy you would expect it. But the other good thing of this um, um, dissipative term, they actually smear across the kernel uh, because of this summation. So it actually helps to remove the numerical oscillation. Um, it actually conserves both linear and angular momentum because of the pairwise uh, interaction. Uh, and because it actually acting uh, in the reverse direction to the velocity, and as a result, they actually replicate the Rayleigh damping or damping coefficient, uh, the damping force that we normally use in the in the continuum mechanics. Now, to give you an idea of how this term works, this is an example of the SPS simulation with and without the uh, dissipative terms. Now, on the left-hand side here is the simulation without dissipative term, and on the right-hand side is the simulation with the dissipative term. And you can see that the numerical oscillation actually occurs when you are not using dissipative term. On the other hand, when you are using this dissipative term on the, on the right-hand side equation, you was able to remove the stress oscillation. On the other hand, you still have an issue related to what Monaghan called shock length scale noise, which is basically um, uh, related to the SPS summation. And the question here is, can we remove this stress noise? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can actually remove this stress noise by a very simple technique. For example, if you want to remove this stress noise to please um, the eyes, what you can do is you can using what we call the stress repolarization techniques, like what we did here. So by using this, what we do is we apply this stress filtering to every um, SPS particle after several uh, cycles of computation, and you should be able to obtain this sort of the result, which look very uh, nice. Uh, on the other hand, even they look please the eye, but they actually not produce significant result compared to the, to, to the, to the traditional methods. Uh, the shock level noise scale noise here is very uh, standard in SPS, and it will not produce any issue in SPS simulation because the SPS itself is actually the summation approach, and therefore the noise would compensate itself within the SPS summation. And therefore, even though the result that we obtain on the right hand side uh, uh, look very nice, but it does not actually produce any significant difference compared to the one on the left hand side. But this actually arises another question is can we actually replace the artificial viscosity? Because this artificial viscosity proposed by Monaghan for the, uh, for the viscous fluid uh, to simulate the viscous stress stress. Um, but in, when we apply to the, to the soil, we don't actually have anything that linked to the material property, right? So this is uh, more or less the term that is designed by a trial and error sort of approach. So what we want to do now is we want to replace this term by something else, which is having more a physical meaning of the, of the classical damping in the solid mechanics. So what you can do is, if you're looking at, um, at, um, at the um, stress localization technique, you can see that without, without using any 
um, dissipated terms, right? Um, we can still produce a good result with the stretch regularization technique that we presented here. But this is a result without uh, any stretch regularization technique. But the only issue here is we actually over predicting um, the runout distance of the granular material. And this is the issue of not having a damping force. And to avoid this problem, what we can do, we can do something very simple. We can actually replace the artificial viscosity by a kind of relay damping force, which is very similar to the damping force that we commonly use in the solid mechanics. This is damping coefficient, this is the velocity, and the damping coefficient here is linked to the material property, right? And by using this, we was able to, again, obtain the result which are very similar to, to the experiments like what you can see from here. This is the result on the left-hand side. You see the numerical result with relay damping. On the right-hand side, you see the simulation result without relay damping. And this, uh, this is the reason why uh, we can uh, conclude here that we can actually reformulate the artificial viscosity by um, very, uh, a very simple form like what we, uh, we, we use here. But the issue of this is, this one is not good at compared to the artificial viscosity because it actually linked directly to the particle. It does not have to smear out the, um, the, the, the straight wave, like, like what you can see from here. And the right hand side, you still see some sort of straight wave, um, which was not be able to dam out by, by this dissipated term. And therefore, uh, some better approach may need to, 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 um, to formulate to remove this sort of wave propagation in, uh, in the computational romance. So here, uh, apart from that, this um, relay damping actually produce quite good result. For example, like what you can see from this result, this simulation result showing the result with the relay damping. And here we have the red line represent experimental result. The, the green line represent the numerical simulation using artificial viscosity. And you can see that both approaches are actually uh, produce quite nice kinematic of runner flow without any, any problem. So this is the, uh, the advantage. Uh, of approach, uh, of this approach. Of course, further um, uh, advance may need to require to, uh, to remove the, uh, the uh, uh, stress uh, wave in the, in the material. All right, the last aspects, I think, how long do I have, uh, Manolo? How much time do I have? Yeah, I think it is uh, until 11.20, but if 11 -20. you want okay. to allocate some time for questions, that would be fine. Okay. So you uh, look. You are the boss. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now I, I think I finish. I'm finishing uh, very soon. Probably in uh, in ten minutes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Now, the last um, topic I would like to touch the base here is the constant model in SPS, and uh, I'm not going to into go into the detail of this because I believe that we're going to have an excellent um, lecture by Professor Wei Wu. Uh, in the next lecture, talking about concept model of, uh, um, uh, of fast granular material. But here, when you do actually Googling on, on SPS, it's very important to understand uh, how we are, what option do we have in terms of concept model. Now, uh, SPS is basically the continuum numerical methods. It's very similar to FVM, uh, except that the way we approximate the governing equation are different. And that the results, the SPS method actually share the same material concept model with the FVM. Right, it's exactly the same. Meaning that any existing concept model or stress return mapping algorithm developed for FEM can be simply adopted in SPS without any modification. So this is the good thing. Now this is the generic concept model that we are using in SPS and the concept model are written for each SPS particle or each RVE uh, point, okay? This is the key. And keep in mind that when you are using um, developing concept model for SPS because we are dealing with a large strand problem. You need to uh, adopt it the Chalman stretch rate to keep the, the stretch objective to the rigid body motion. But this is still not a very rigorous approach. Um, the more rigorous approach would be to adopt this uh, 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 finite deformation theory. Uh, but again, this is not something I want to discuss in this lecture. Um, and here is a range of concept model that we can uh, and we have been successful to implement it in SPS, ranging from very simple elastics to perfectly plastic or softening uh, material, or even damage and fracture, that's something we discussed in, in the next lecture. The issue that we are working with SPS is 
we don't have element tests. This is the most critical issue. When you implement a concept model in SPS, you don't know whether you are actually uh, implement the concept model correctly or not. In FEM, you have element tests. You can do one single element, uh, FEM element, to check your concept model, right? You can, you can actually load the, the model, uh, the, the, the element in different loading conditions to check, uh, to test the, the concept model. But in SPS, we don't have. So what can we do? What they can do here is, and we have been quite successful in, uh, in, our, in our research, is to using this, what we call element test in SPS to check the concept model. So what we're doing here is, when you implement a concept model in SPS, um, if you want to check uh, the performance of concept model in your course, you can actually produce or create a computational domain like this, like what we have here. And then you're going to design the center area at the area where you allow the particle to freely move, while the outer area here will be the area where you impose the sharing velocity. And this condition here are corresponding to constant volume sharing. And this is the, an example of what we achieved with the, with the very simple more column or trucker plugger uh, concept model, uh, elastic, perfectly plastic concept model uh, with different confining stress. For example, what you're doing here is um, you can actually sharing the soil under different confining stress, right? And then you can actually calculate the average or the sum of all stress of particles within this area here, okay? And then you plot the stress strain relationship, this is a uh, stress strain relationship. And then you see that for the elastic perfectly plastic concept model, you should actually having this sort of behavior, right? Um, elastic and perfectly plastic. And in terms of the stress loading path, you should start from the confining strap and go straight upward until you're reaching the use of it. And you, you, you should stay here because this is the, uh, the elastic perfectly plastic. And of course, the analytical result here uh, can be obtained by using uh, a concept level test, okay? This is a, a very simple way to test a concept model. And this is a very simple concept model as well. You can also test um, using the same concept here to test a quite complex concept model. For example, what we're doing here is we're checking for a critical state concept model. And for this critical state concept model, we're actually looking at the material with different states, dense, mediums, and loose. And you can see here that we can even testing the behavior of material when they actually undergo the, um, the liquid fraction um, behavior. And one of the important aspects uh, that you need to keep an eye in this element test here is that when you're testing sharing the soil, you need to make sure that there's no structural failure occur in your test, right? Otherwise, you would not be able to obtain a correct solution. And this is, again, you can see the very um, um, good uh, kind of the element test in SPS, which I believe that if you are working on SPS, I would like to see more of this sort of application when you are submitting paper. Because in many cases, when I review the SPS paper, many other paper are actually undermining this important uh, component uh, and ignoring um, whether they are actually implement the concept model in SPS or not. Um, when it comes to the prediction, you can see that if you actually correctly implement a concept model in SPS, you were expecting a good prediction. For example, here, uh, you should be able to predict uh, a very similar result to FEM uh, for small deformation problem, of course. Uh, and in this case here, we compare the finite element solution with the plexus, uh, SPS with plexus for small deformation problem. And you can see that the SPS could produce the, um, the result to a very good order of accuracy to the plexus, uh, plexus uh, 15 node here, which is the high order accuracy elements. You can also be able to simulate the problem like what you can see here for granular flows, 2D and 3D, with matching very well with the, with the experiments. Or you can even actually, um, if you ensure that your concept model work, you should be able to simulate this very um, interesting uh, problem. For example, in this particular case, um, we can simulate the behavior of granular material under different state, right? So you can see that and you can the behave how they are different from the loose to medium and then stay. And this was a work conducted by one of my current uh, PhD students. And all uh, the other application, which is uh, also highlight the need of SPS here, uh, is the, uh, the, the, the problem related to last deformation, uh, excavation problem. In this particular case here, where um, we're trying to test the performance of SPS, so we're simulating the experiment conducted by ITO in 2009. 
And what you can see here is they actually excavate the soil, excavate the soil, and they're having a number of instrumentation here to actually uh, measure the soil deformation and when actually the slope is going to collapse. And this is the case where you can see that the SPS can predict fairly well uh, the location where the slope is collapsed, unlike the finite elements where you actually continue, uh, uh, you predict actually continuous deformation uh, without any, any, any collapse, okay? Now, different from the lato plastic consumer that I discussed earlier, we also have a different option in SPS to model what we call debris flows, right? In this case, the stress tensor we are requiring for a momentum equation are formulated different. Uh, they actually following the composition of fluid dynamic approach, right? Where the pressure can be calculated by a stiff equation, which is the a function of density, and the viscous cell stress can be calculated following the relativity model, which is again following the traditional uh, composition of fluid dynamic approach. And here's a couple of options for the pressure equation. For example, Monahan in 1994, when he first expanded the SPF method for um, uh, simulate the free surface problem of water, he actually formulated the equation which can be obtained by imposing the condition of 1% um, density variation. Or Maurice actually proposed the equation which again calculate the pressure as a function of density where C is the south speed um, in water. And I actually propose a very simple equation based on the, um, the um, compression uh, test which basically telling that the pressure can be calculated from the bulk model loss uh, uh, and also a function of density where this equation has been tested to work with the, with the soil in, in 2006. And in terms of the viscous cell stress component that we can have here, you have the option of using the big ham fluid model where you can actually introduce um, the shear strength of material, uh, which is more column failure criteria to the big ham fluid, right? And, and this is the relationship between the viscous cell stress where you have this is the effective viscosity, and this is the, the stress strain rate, and this is the viscous cell stress. And similarly, if you are dealing with a very fast granular material, you can actually, using a very well-known um, um, regulatory model proposed by CHOPS, uh, which is um, telling you that the viscosity now is a function of the, of the initial, um, initial number and also the pressure uh, dependent uh, behavior. And here's a couple of examples, the last example that I would like to show. Uh, this is the, the comparison uh, of SPS model uh, using some high of the regulatory model, and this was conducted by one of my uh, master's students. Um, and you can see that the um, using the regulatory model, MUI model here, uh, we can predict very well the run out distance and comparable result between the elato plastics model with the MUI model, like what you can see from here, comparison between MUI and DP model. But when it comes to prediction of the stress, right, the stress profile, now you can see the clear distinction. With the DP model, we will be able to capture this sort of the, the arching stress in the, in the granular material, like what you can see very clear here. Um, you have experimental data and you have the SPS result and the SPS was able to predict very nice the arching stress in the, in the granular material. But with the MUI model, you will not be able to capture this behavior. You capture something like, like this. Like that's why you're actually having this, this form. You're actually predicting the parabolic shape, parabolic shape of the stress distribution. Um, so this is some sort of the, the comparison that we, we reported in, in our recent publication in computer and geotechnics. Um, so with this, I would like to end my uh, presentation on the fundamental aspect of SPS. I think I'm, I, I'm on time, I think. So, this is the key conclusion uh, that I want to make. Uh, first of all, is the, um, the SPS method is quite powerful tools to simulate the field scale problem, right? It's, 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 it's more targeted to large information and port failure problem. Um, it also uh, applicable and also have um, a potential to model the multi-phase, multi-physical process that I'm going to explain in the next lecture. Uh, but keep in mind that when you are looking at something for small deformation, FEM is still uh, the best option and don't try the USPS for, uh, for some small information problem. Uh, in this lecture, I also discussed some fundamental aspects, aspect of SPS and I hope I have clear some existing misconception on the concept as well as the, the capability of the methods. And my key conclusion from this lecture is, um, it's very important to understand the key concept of SPS, some of it advantages and its disadvantages, because sometimes 
the disadvantage um, uh, feature might become a very useful uh, tool to actually obtain some uh, purpose uh, or some, some numerical purposes. So with it, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great, uh, Professor Pui, thank you very much. It's a very excellent lecture. And from, from the collision of, of two stars, the star dust to the real dust problem of the geomechanics. And uh, yeah, good timing as well. And we still have, so we leave some, some time if, uh, if anyone from the audience has questions, and now we, we have some time to interact with, uh, with the lecturer. In order to do this, uh, you may wish to, to turn on to turn on your microphone. Maybe I'll, I'll share my screen again. May, may I ask a first question? Yeah. Oh, Professor Felix. Hello. Uh, I can hello. help you. <laughs> How are you? Oh, fine, fine. It was a great pleasure to, to follow your, uh, your presentation. Thank maybe, you very much. I can, uh, maybe I will try to make my face visible. There you are. <laughs> I have to, I didn't see you, but I have to uh, also uh, thanks, uh, thank you very much for recommending me to this, uh, this, uh, this, 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 uh, others. Thank you. Oh, it was a pleasure. So, um, I have a question about the question um, of uh, convergence. You, you know, for the finite element method, we have a clear theorem of convergence, which um, tell us that when the sizes of the elements is tending to zero, uh, the result from a finite element computation will tend asymptotically uh, to uh, continuum mechanics results. Uh, what kind of, um, of, um, of convergent theorem uh, it's possible to, to obtain with a SPH method? What, what, is it possible to, to to validate uh, the method in an uh, asymptotic manner with respect to, to continuum mechanics? Is the, well, I, I think is uh, the first thing is um, um, we are actually solving the strong form equation, the strong form. So we're actually bypassing the convection. And SPH itself is the continuum methods. It's nothing different from FEM. It's only different is the way you approximate um, the, 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 the um, the, the, the spatial, uh, the, the gradient of, of, the, of the governing equation. So they actually exactly the same. The only difference is um, the, we actually solving the strong form equation and therefore we bypassing the convection term. Um, and in terms of validation that you, that you mentioned, we actually validate SPS with, um, this is the, perhaps this is one of the, this is a validation at the, at the FEM level, extremely small deformation. Um, we compare the SPS solution uh, for elastic deformation uh, for different applications that you can see from here. So we actually obtain the perfect mass with analytical uh, experiment um, for very small deformation problem. Okay. Okay, <laughs> that's clear. Thank you. Uh Thank you. <laughs> okay, I will. Okay, I have the microphone on. So I would uh, first of all, uh, I have liked very much your presentation. It, it is uh, just mixing all sort of interesting things, and the and the cocktail was was excellent. So uh, many questions, but anyway, I have just one which uh, would be interesting to some people doing non-local. 
uh, constitutive modeling. Uh, you were saying at the beginning that uh, it is an, uh, the, I think it was the first of the very non-local first... feature. Yes, yes. Yeah, non-local. What what do you think about using it for non-local non-local models that use this those of integral form, not of the gradient? I mean, because I I think it, they should be they, very easy to 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 do, and probably uh, many people should have been doing it already. Yeah. I think that, that, that is a, a very nice question. Uh, it's actually, this is the one that um, uh, one of my uh, students actually looking into this problem together with Professor Felix. His name is uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Sao Han. Um, it's, it's actually, if you're looking at the way we, we approximate uh, the acid equation, if we're actually fixing the kernel, uh, the sign of the kernel domain, if we're actually fixing the sign of the kernel domain in own SPS, in own simulation, we actually producing the non-local model, meaning that when we try to predict, trying to um, to predict the shear band thickness, we we can obtain the consistent shear band if we fixing the kernel function. On the other hand, if we don't fixing the kernel function and we, if we allow the kernel function to change with the particle resolution, then the size of the kernel function now is become. Uh, a sign of finite element mass. But is it better than the finite elements because it's still having a little smear out uh, compared to the finite element, where finite element is only interacting within the particle, but the sign of kernel is still interacting within the supporting domain. So what happened is in a non-local constant model, we have a length scale. In the SPS, we have a length scale of the numerical length scale. We should not be mixing that two length scale. And I wouldn't I want to keep SPS at a, a sign, a numerical length scale. I don't want to link that to concept model at this, at this stage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, excellent. very excellent question. And it's very nice. So I think we are looking at at the moment because tomorrow I'm going to present something related to length scale problem. Uh, that's where we actually interacting these two components. Okay. So, I mean, uh, any questions from the from the audience? I was just checking the chat uh, to, to see if there, there was something, but there, there is nothing. Can I, can, I, can I also ask yes, a yes, question? Yes, of course. Aman. Yeah, or maybe, maybe I share my video as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ha. Arman here. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> you should ask. You should come to Monat and ask me. <laughs> Look, I've, yeah, I've seen you many times, and I meant to ask this question many times, but now this is, I thought this is a good, good, um, good. opportunity. Good. Thanks, great talks, and thanks for the organizers, Professor Wu, um, everyone, Chino. So thank, thanks to, to anyone. Ha, I, I'm just wondering when you add these terms, like for. Um, to, to remove in instability and this artificial velocity and things like that. Don't you gradually change the, the physics of the problem? So that's um, because you're kind of changing the, the governing equation, I believe. So that and that is like changing the, the physics of the problem. What is the yeah. um, implication here? This is the, uh, this is the, the, the something related to the, um, to the um, artificial stress, right? That's where we're looking at, um, let me bring it up. I'll discuss this aspect. Yeah, because there was artificial stress and there was like that um, artificial um, damping as well. So the, yeah. there are like few yeah. few things that you kind of yeah, add and remove. Different. Yeah, this one and damping too. Yeah. So I'm just wondering. Yeah. yeah. I understand your question. Let's start with this one, right? When we have this one now, when we're looking at this problem here, uh, we actually. Honestly, if you're looking at the, um, we taking, I, I think we may be taking too much cautious on this problem, where in soy, in soy, in principle, when the stress state of soy actually falling within this zone, right, the soy would be um, would fracture, fracture, right? They, they, they shouldn't actually remain continuous, right? But then in the finite elements, well, and, and that's why in, I think in the finite element methods, uh, we cannot simulate this sort of problem, right? For example, like, um, like, like, like fracture like this. So what we want to do here is we want to produce the same results that compare to FEM. And this term here is only activate, it's only activate when they actually 
um, two particles getting close to each other, meaning that it should not actually introduce or change the physics of the, of the material because it only activates when the particle getting close, but when they're actually away from each other, they remain, um, they, 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 they inactivate this term. So in other words, it, it may change, there was some sort of the, um, how to say, the compensation between the accuracy of the problem and the, um, the physics. So if you're leaving untreated, the particle may actually getting close to its order and you actually getting the incorrect some sort of, of uh, uh, mm -hmm. estimation. And therefore you try to using some sort of techniques to actually pushing them away from its order. And then after they remain a relatively good shape, then you remove that sort of the, uh, that sort of problem. So what I can say here is it may slightly change the physics when you're having the issue related to tensile and splitting, but that is, but we're having different options. For example, what you can do here is, if you don't want, or you don't want to using this, um, this uh, artificial stress term, you can simply do like um, using the tension cutoff. That means you're not allowed the soil to, 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 to subject to tension cutoff, to, to tension. So then it still actually work very well. Now, for the, for the case that related to um, viscosity. Now, for viscosity, um, in FEM simulation, we impose the quasi-static condition, right? Now, in the, in the, uh, um, when you're actually using the dynamic simulation, you need some sort of damping. So the viscosity actually is, is simulating the damping force. It's not actually non-physics. The only problem is how do we actually measuring this damping force? That's the issue I discussed. Artificial because city formulation produced by Professor Morahan is great, working very well. But the only issue is they're not actually linking to any material property. That's the issue I don't like. And that's why in the in the in, in this talk, I I I I, I uh, suggest an option to replace the artificial because city by the Rayleigh damping, which is the conventional damping force we are using in continuum mechanics. With this one, we're actually having a clear physics. We know that this damping coefficient needs to be linked to the material property. So that, that is the two terms we are, there's only two terms we actually need to add into the, to the SVA equation at the moment. If you're looking at, if you're working with the cohesive soil, you may subtract it to the particle fraction. That's what I, I presented there. And this was actually uncheated in MPM, particle finite element, or any other methods because they are not serious, right? So I can leave it uncheated as well. But if you really want to cheat it, then you can use this approach. The second one is related to artificial viscosity. That's where I think other method is also using that when you are dealing with the, the fully dynamic equation. All right, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Hope to see you all soon in a conference or something. Yeah, hopefully we are in a lockdown soon and we can meet. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, if if uh, I think that we have something like uh, fifteen minutes of break, in which uh, should we have been in Osua, we would have go for a coffee to the cafeteria yeah. and have time to discuss everybody together everything but uh, now we will be having coffee at home or at the, the university so uh, at, after 15 minutes uh, professor way would be starting with his lecture regarding constitutive models that uh, all of you will be will be uh, enjoying and uh, ha, uh, many many thanks for your excellent lecture so it has been uh, quite quite nice Okay, so see you around in, in 15 minutes, okay? Yeah. See you then. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.